Welcome to Topic 1, Introduction to the Descriptive Statistics. You'll hopefully come to appreciate that running descriptive statistics on your data set uh, is absolutely crucial before you begin the process of conducting the inferential statistics. Many people do not take the time, especially uh, novice folks at uh, research, they don't take the time to carefully run descriptive statistics and screen and clean their data and make sure that the data meet the assumptions that are required of the more robust statistical test. But it's absolutely imperative that this process be done correctly. Statistics is the collection and organization interpretation of data. And there are two broad categories within this field. Descriptive, in which you present and organize and summarize your data, and inferential. This is where you run different tests and draw conclusions about your sample that uh, we can impute to a population, provided that our sample is representative of the population. So we uh, run descriptive statistics so that we can describe the characteristics of our sample and infer that to the larger population. In inferential statistics, these are values that, as I said, infer those results to the larger unknown population from our sample results. So we summarize, describe, and characterize the sample that's being studied. We determine if that sample has a normal distribution or bell curve. And most statistical tests require that sample to have a normal bell curve shape. Uh, we determine if the sample can be compared to the larger population and we display descriptive statistics as tables and charts, percentages, frequency distributions, and we report variability in measures of central tendency. So descriptive statistics includes the following information about a sample. Central tendency, sample mean or average, the median or midpoint, and the mode, the most frequently occurring number. Let's say that we are collecting data on a sample and we're looking at anthropometrics. We might collect height, and weight, um, maybe uh, waist circumference, mid-arm muscle mass. So for each one of those, we would have um, a mean, a midpoint, and a most frequently occurring number in our sample. We would also measure the variability in our sample the range, which is the difference between the largest and the smallest variable, the variance, how far the numbers are spread out, and the standard deviation, which is how much variation exists from the average and the sample mean. Skewness will let us know how symmetrical the distribution of the variables are for each one of those categories, and kurtosis will let us know if our data is um, peaked or flat. If it's peaked, then a lot of the, the uh, sample is very, very similar. If it's uh, more flat, then we have a wide distribution of different subjects in our sample. Shape of the curve of the numbers will help us understand uh, if uh, we have a frequently occurring number, if there are outliers, and if the data is skewed. The mean is the most reliable measure of central tendency for making inferences about a population from a sample. Interval and ratio level statistical tools can be used. We compute the mean by summing all the values and dividing by the number of values. However, in a sample where there are extreme measures, what we call outliers, the mean might not be the best statistic to describe our sample. A good example is a data set of salaries. If you have one or two millionaires mixed in with people making minimum wage, the outliers, the millionaires, will increase the mean and make it appear that salaries are quite high for that sample. The median is the midpoint of a set of ordered values. 50% of the distribution will be above the median and 50% below it. The median is also known as the 50th percentile. It is not sensitive to outliers and would be appropriate for interval, ratio, and ordinal level data. The median would be a much better statistic to report than the mean in the sample or the example that I gave you about salaries. The mode is the most frequently occurring value or category. 
If there are, if no two categories are the same, there is no mode. More than one mode is possible. Some data may be bimodal. For example, in our example about the um, uh, measuring anthropometrics, you could have a hundred adults and the most frequently occurring height might be 5'3 and 5'5. Five five. Maybe the mode for men is, is the higher number and the mode for the women would be 5'3. Mode is appropriate for all levels of measurement, but it is the only measure of central tendency that can be used for nominal variables like gender, race, grade, etc. So when you report this data, you can't report gender or race or grade or blood types as an average. You can't average blood types together. They're not related. You simply report them as number and percent. This is very important to remember, especially when you do your homework. A frequency distribution illustrated in this slide is a method of tallying and representing how often certain scores or categories occur. It's also an easy method of determining the mode of a sample. These are uh, visual examples of frequency distributions. So we could have a sample where there's only one frequently occurring score clustered there at the top bimodal where you have two values that occur frequently and multimodal. The range is the simplest measure of dispersion or variability. It is the difference between the minimum and maximum values. It is sensitive to extreme values. It is subject to sample size and usually reported as minimum and maximum values rather than a single number. For example, children in a data set who range in age from 3 to 10 years uh, is better reported than saying the range equals 7. We have more of an idea of the range of our children if we give the minimum and maximum. Standard deviation is the most frequently used measure of dispersion or variability. It represents the average distance of scores or values from the mean. The sum of all deviations from the mean will be equal to zero. It's best used when data is not multimodal. The standard deviation is, is sensitive to extreme values, so it's important when interpreting normal distributions to realize that. It is written as SD and computed as displayed on the screen. Rather than use the full number of data points when we're uh, dividing that uh, denominator, we use n minus 1 to limit bias. It's referred to as degrees of freedom. In other words, if you have a sample data set of 100, you would use 99. I will explain why we use degrees freedom in a, a later um, lecture. The bell curve represents a normal distribution of data. You will notice that 68% of the values in a normally distributed sample will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% of the values will fall within two standard deviations of the mean, if you look at this area under the curve, and 99% of the values will fall within three standard deviations of the mean. This is extremely important to remember as we progress through the course. The variance is the squared standard deviation. It's not reported as frequently as the standard deviation because it's not a number that is representative of the values in the sample. Interpercentile measures describes a score relative to others in a distribution. The first quartile represents the 25th percentile second quartile the 50th, and the third quartile the 75th. We visually represent this data in a box plot. You'll get an opportunity to compute a box plot in SPSS in your first assignment. Box plots can also be set to show outliers so that you'll know if uh, there are data in your data set that might need to be looked at again. Perhaps it was entered incorrectly, or maybe it's a legitimate number, but it will tell you if you have some numbers in there that may be skewing your data a bit. 
Interquartile range values extend from the 25th to the 75th percentile. The first quartile is the middle value of data points below the median. The third quartile is the middle value of all data points above the median. This is not sensitive to extreme values, again, because it does show you the outliers and they're computed uh, independently of these outliers. When constructing a histogram in SPSS, one can add the distribution line that you see here uh, demonstrated in these three graphs. <clears throat> this will help you to visually draw some conclusions about your distribution of scores in a sample. If the data are skewed to the right, also known as a positive skew, that means there's a long right tail. There are a lot of scores in your sample that are in the extreme right of the distribution. If the data are skewed left, also known as a negative skew, this means there's a lot of scores in the long left tail. Another way to size up skewness is by comparing the mean and the median and the mode to each other. If the mean is greater than the mode and the median, we know the data are positively skewed. If the data are skewed left, the mean will be less than the median and the mode. A skewness greater than 0.5 or negative 0.5 is considered moderately skewed and skewness greater than a plus or minus 1 is extremely skewed. Skewness can be calculated by subtracting the median from the mean and dividing that number by the standard deviation. You can also just let SPSS calculate it for you by checking the radio button in the dialog box for this option and we'll show you how to do this in the procedures video. Data that are highly skewed cannot use robust statistical tests. Weaker tests must be used. Calculating skewness is a very important part of conducting descriptive statistical tests. Kurtosis provides a visual estimate of variance in a sample. It's a measure of whether the data are peaked or flat relative to a normal distribution. Kurtosis value meaning zero. A kurtosis greater than 2 is leptokurtic. It's sharper than a normal distribution with values concentrated around the mean and has thicker tails. This means high probability for extreme values and little variance. A kurtosis with a negative number more than minus 1 is platykurtic distribution, flatter or think platypus, than a normal distribution and has a wider peak. The probability for extreme values is less than for a normal distribution and the values are spread out wider. We have a greater variance standard deviation around the mean. Kurtosis equals zero or close to it is mesokurtic distribution or normal, for example.